Uh, Kyle Bass, thank you for making the time. Great to be here, Keith. So we, you have in your background there, you have a flag, and it looks like an American flag, but it's not your typical um, American flag. Can you explain, uh, can you explain what that is? Uh, you know, uh, I was uh, blessed to be sent uh, present by uh, the, the late Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, who happened to be a friend of mine. And uh, this was the flag that flew over the U.S. Capitol building on the 10th anniversary of September 11th. So uh, it's a it's a prized possession and it's uh, it's a reminder of uh, of grand strategy and the and the uh, um, the blood, sweat and tears that have that, that have democracy where it is today. So I I tend to be uh, someone that, that tries to focus on all of those things all the time. That's a cool thing, man. Um, I came to America or your country in the uh, middle of the 1990s. And I, when I got here, first of all, I thought New Haven, Connecticut was the industrial you know, mecca of the world uh, from where I came. But, um, but I, always, you know, I always loved the idea as a Canadian uh, of American capitalism, you know, of that free market nature to what it was. And, and back then, I, I have to say, it really you know, it was, was, I don't know about my feelings. I, I like to not talk about feelings when it comes to markets, but I, it certainly is something for a, a, a young Canadian man that it was, was very evident. And, um, you know, nowadays we, we have different definitions for different things. So I, I just wanted to, you know, thank you. Like, you're, you're one of the very few people who's willing to speak pa you know, patriotically within the lens of, of Amer proper American capitalism. And, and I, I think a lot of people should say thank you for, you know, for that. So, so I wanted to do that. I appreciate that, Keith. Now, on the topic that, uh, you know, you know, you, I think people are expecting to hear something from Kyle Bass on China. OK, so uh, how about chi uh, China, COVID? What, what are you thinking um, with China these days? So uh, this is something that, that we haven't talked about before, nor have I said, I think, publicly. But I, it, it, it may, be, may be thrown out as a fringe thought. But what I'd like to do is be just be a little provocative uh, on the look back. Let's look back to the beginning of this virus. And, and Keith, what I think you're one of the world's best at is calling the ball and the strike uh, passionately, but not emotionally, uh, emotionally. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, understanding which one of the sectors uh, the world's in and how to invest around it. Um, what I what I like to do, what I like to do is uh, think about why a specific pitch was thrown and what the strategy of the game was uh, other than just calling the balls and the strikes. And in this case, when we talk about COVID, just think about, uh, again, whether it was intentionally made in the lab or re released from the lab or accidentally released in Wuhan, however it came about, think about the timing of when it came about. If you remember China's current account, China's current account was actually moving in the negative territory. And when you think about why, uh, and you look at the different uh, 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 foundational uh, building blocks of that current account, uh, the, the Chinese uh, citizenry were traveling around the world more, they were spending more, they were investing what they were allowed to invest in various uh, Western nations, uh, let's say under the laws, there were certain limits to the amount they could spend on their credit cards and spend abroad. But so many of them were traveling that there was a massive outflow of dollars. And when you think about China, there are two Chinas. There is the yuan based China, which is internal. And then there is how China interfaces with the rest of the world externally, which is primarily in dollars, right? No one accepts their currency as legal tender uh, for a, a great amount of trade, right? About 88% of their trade settles in dollars. And they have to buy things from the rest of the world to exist every day, right? They don't have enough energy. They don't have enough food. They don't have basic materials. They don't have enough base metals. They need all of those things from the rest of the world. They need to spend dollars. So interestingly enough, the current account was headed to zero uh, or below zero uh, at the same time that the, China, that the uh, uh, protests in Hong Kong were at their zenith. And magically, COVID comes. And what does it do? It shuts down the Chinese uh, uh, populace from traveling abroad, uh, spending abroad, investing abroad. At the same time, it enables them to quietly take over Hong Kong. Now, fast forward, uh, and, and again, uh, uh, maybe that was just coincidental. And now you have uh, the world was reopening uh, prior to Putin's invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, and then Putin uh, attacks the Ukraine at a time in which we've had seven years of underinvestment in hydrocarbons uh, due to the, the intense desire to flip a switch to go alternative energy and, and crude oil, what does it do? 
uh, it trades to 123 bucks. And within just a couple of days of crude touching 123 and food prices spiking, what happens next? The Chinese announced, miraculously, they announced the closing of Shenzhen due to a COVID outbreak. Now, remember, China really didn't have any COVID outbreaks all along. They, they reported 5,000 uh, deaths over, over a, a two-year period, uh, essentially unfazed by this uh, global disaster that's killed over 6 million people. So miraculously, crude oil drops $20 in five days. Uh, and, and then crude trades back up uh, from uh, sub 100 to $117 a barrel. And right then, literally within two days, they announced the, the two-phase closure of Shanghai. Uh, and crude drops another 20 bucks in three days. Um, and so when I think about China's grand strategy and what's going on today with the intense closure of now Guangzhou and, and several other cities in China that they're telegraphing all over the world. What does that do, Keith? Well, that makes Wall Street analysts say, oh, our China growth numbers aren't, aren't uh, what we thought they were gonna be. And the global demand side of, of all of the commodities from food to energy uh, to basic materials is selling off every time they close a new city. I think it's fascinating. I think it's very well-timed. I think it's, uh, um, potentially manipulative. And I think that uh, the global press just seems to take these closures, uh, uh, not even with a grain of salt. They report them immediately. Uh, they report it as truth, uh, and then they move forward. And, and I think China got caught desperately short global commodities um, and uh, is trying to do everything they can to slow down expectations to keep these prices low so they can acquire as many of them as possible. You know what's really interesting about that? I mean, because, I mean, in, literally, I, don't, I, I doubt you watch the macro show. you got other things going on. But uh, points number, I always do the top three things in the macro show. So the things that are moving today that on the margin, you know, in particular space, which matters in macro, it's the particulars that matter, not the average of things, the, partic the particular yeah. things. And today was really, number one was China, number two was oil. Guys, you could show it. And I and hook, line, sinker, whether you're right or wrong, this guy said, oh, that's a China demand slowing point. You know, and that, that you know, when, when we were looking at this oil, you know, drop from, you know, it went from down 2% when I got up this morning to down 5%, 4 or 5%. And um, <clears throat> that really should change the calculus for a lot of people. You know, a big difference between a $93 oil price, obviously, and a $123 oil price. So, you know, that's, that's a real interesting, what you're saying is that there's, um, you know, there should be at least considered a puppeteering of it all because you know how to move the big pieces. Is that, is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, I think I think when you look at global demand, let's say global demand for crude. First of all, it's inelastic. The only thing that kills it is price, right? There's demand destruction at some point in time yeah. with price. Uh, but let's say it's 100, 100 million barrels a day. Russia produces 11 and a half, um, exports eight. The U.S. is the largest uh, energy producer in the world. Russia's second. Uh, but let's say, uh, first of all, that at some point in time, Putin decides that he's behind and that he's going to use a chemical or uh, weapon or a tactical nuke, and the U.S. ends up sanctioning their energy business. If we take 8 million barrels or let's say 4 million barrels uh, off the world market, and we actually, sh that will structurally impair Russia's ability to produce, right? If you back up a system that has no storage uh, from full production to whatever it will be, it, it has a major geologic destructive uh, uh, result on the, on the wells. And to turn off wells and then turn them back on or to shut them in and turn them back on, there's no light switch. This takes many years. And so if we reduce the number of barrels on market uh, by creating these sanctions, uh, then we're going to have crude oil prices that people are gonna need a calculator to figure out. Mm -hmm. And what, what everyone's reacting to right now is China's closure of cities which it never did really in the beginning. They said they did. They said they they said they said never really uh, had an outbreak. And now magically they're having outbreaks when the one thing that can that can replace a regime or cause enough uh, uh, uprising to replace a regime, as you've probably seen in the past, uh, are food prices and energy prices. Yep. Whether you look to the Tiananmen Square riots in 1989 or whether you look at the, at the Arab Spring, both of those were caused by uh, food prices. And you think about the coming famine, 
um, a third of the world's wheat and barley is made is, is produced in Russia and, and Ukraine. And I can promise you one thing, these farmers aren't out farming next year's crop or planting next year's crop right now. We're going to have a major, major food crisis in the next 12 months. And that's going to be a big problem for China. Well, that's um, yeah, it's, it's, and there's a question which we'll get into is, you know, is the puppeteering coordinated between the Chinese and the Russians, et cetera? Mm. I mean, it was very interesting to me. A client was very quick to, to show me, you know, on the day of Biden's big announcement on on the SPR release um, that Putin was quick to shut in the Tengiz field, which was like, OK, boom, you do this. Boom, I do that. And he's running a pretty big trade surplus on the stuff that he sells, right? Um, and, and then yeah. he tur turns around, you know, he's selling people oil and energy related products at the highest prices we've seen in a long time. And he's selling wheat, you know, et cetera. When you, what do you think about that, number one? Um, is he, sometimes in macro at least, I think people um, may, may think there's too much puppeteering, particularly when it comes to Putin. People obviously think he's smarter than Biden. But I mean, the, you know, like, what do you think? Do you think that he's got all the pieces moving that way? Like you're playing a global macro video game almost? Yeah, I, th I think that I think there is a grand strategy. And clearly, if you look back at that February 4th joint press release between Xi and Putin, uh, go read it line by line. Uh, they tell you what they're going to do. They talk about forming a strategic partnership that has no areas or no, no areas that are off limits. They talk about the strength of this partnership and the longevity of the partnership and what the partnership will and won't do. They come out and, and endorse each other's moves in Ukraine and in Taiwan, i.e. Russia's uh, 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 re reacquiring Ukraine and uh, Russia endorsing China's, China's one China policy and the reacquisition of Taiwan, the Taiwanese separatists. I mean, you can't even make that up, Keith. <laughs> but when you go back to this, to, to Russia shutting in a field, I'll, I'll say one thing, I have a different take on that. Um, there has been a um, uh, somewhat uh, of a reluctance of some of the people in the West, some of the buyers in the West to buy Russian crude, given the atrocities and the, and the, uh, the indiscriminate killing that Putin's uh, 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 laying on the Ukrainians. So uh, right now, there's about a 500,000 barrel a day, uh, uh, let's say overproduction by Russia, because Russia is having trouble marketing those 500,000 barrels. Yeah. Um, and Keith, what that's doing is Russia essentially has no oil storage in its system. It uses its pipelines as storage. Mm -hmm. Well, those at 500,000 barrels a day, those pipelines get backed up. And if they back up into the fields in Siberia, it, requi it requires shut-ins. So yep. what's happening is the, the reluctance. Again, so not, not a, a complete sanctioning, but just a simple Western reluctance to buy some of his crude yep. is causing major problems in his oil fields. His calculus in the beginning, my view, is he could roll Ukraine in the first week or two. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the West has really, I think he miscalculated on NATO's uh, uh, convergence instead of divergence. And I think that uh, there are so many people and entities in the West quietly helping Zelensky uh, push back the, the Russians that now he's, he's, he's en engaged in uh, trying to troubleshoot a problem he didn't think he was going to have. Uh, he didn't think that we'd have the, the the balls to sanction his energy business, which so far we haven't. But that simple reluctance is causing major problems back up these pipelines. Right. So if and when we decide to sanction his energy business, we can cause huge, yeah, huge. decade long problems on the back end, uh, which will, again, be very difficult for China because, again, demand for crude is inelastic, in my view. Uh, and it's something that the tacticians I think miscalculated on, but again, I don't think that the coincidence of them shutting in the the fields uh, with Biden's announcement um, had causal effect. I, th I think they were different causals. Different yeah, cases. yeah, that uh, Tengiz fields in Kazakhstan, um, obviously. Yeah. So with that one, but you know, to your point, your broader point, like in terms of what's actually going on here, in terms of self-interest, corruption. You had an awesome tweet. Um, the tweet that he had on April eighth, guys, uh, with that had. Uh, the ex-German chancellor. That was mm. like, most people, like, well, I didn't know that. I mean, let's just start with that. And what do I know? I don't know anything. Um, but I read Kyle Bass's tweets, so I feel like I, I fi figure something out once in a while. <laughs> but this is, if you could show that tweet, guys, and maybe you just um, link the West to the German, in this case, to the Germans, if you were trying to do that or not. I mean, it's, it's, it's you're the one who had the tweet. Mm, thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, look, Keith, I think that, um, 
I did a lot on sanctions compliance um, in the institutional world back in 2018. And uh, in my in-depth analysis of U.S. primary sanctions, right, primary sanctions are easy. Um, U.S. decided back then to sanction the Iranian Republican Guard, uh, certain members of, of the Iranian leadership and uh, terrorist networks and things like that. When we sanction any of those things, if you and I happen to have money invested, whether we are an institutional investor or family office in the U.S., you are forced to, to divest of those things. You may not own, uh, support, engage in, invest in anything that's that is subject to U.S. primary uh, OFAC sanctions. Yep. What mm-hmm. I what I was thinking about back then uh, was that if you continue to do business, let's assume you are Siemens or let's assume you are a German bank or let's assume you are a Chinese bank and uh, the U.S. has sanctioned an entity in Iran that you actually do business with and you say, you know what, I'm just not going to adhere to those sanctions. I'm going to keep doing business with that Iranian institution that the U.S. sanctioned. You are deemed to be what's a called a scrutinized entity or an entity that the U.S. Treasury can sanction immediately with secondary mm-hmm. sanctions because you didn't comply with primary sanctions. Well, guess what? The investing universe continued to invest in all of those companies, those scrutinizable entities. The number one country that has public scrutinizable entities in the world is Germany. So Germany does more business with the Iranians, the Chinese and the Russians than any Western country. Uh, and so that was something I, that I learned in 2018. And, and when you look at the, the depth of the relationships that Germany has with, let's call it the axis of authoritarians or the evil despotic regimes of the world, it's pretty shocking. And uh, when, when you look at Gerhard Schroeder and the former chancellor of Germany, who was the architect of the denuclearization or turning off the nukes in Germany because supposedly they weren't green uh, and knowing that their reliance on Russian gas was going to be uh, the ultimate uh, end of the road for Germany. Uh, A former president of the United States who I've had the opportunity to sit with um, brought this up to Schroeder uh, back in the early 2000s and said, do you think that, uh, let's say, charting a course for almost complete dependence on on Russian energy is a good idea? Uh, Schroeder said, yeah, you know, we have a great relationship with the Russians. We are becoming more of a global society and, and they are westernizing and we don't think it's a problem whatsoever. Well, fast forward and you see that he's chairman of the board of Rosneft and Gazprom added him to the board 20 days before Putin's invasion. You can't even make that up. The Russians bought the German chancellor and Merkel went along with it. You know, Merkel wants to have a nice quiet retirement. And and you know what? She needs to be called out. The Germans are in bed with many of the despotic regimes around the world. And if, if we want sanctions to be real and we want them to have teeth and we want people to fear uh, the tip of our economic spear uh, from in the West, then we need to be serious about sanctions. We need to immediately secondarily sanction anyone that's not complying with primary sanctions. And a perfect case in point, Keith, is when Visa and MasterCard took the Russian banks off of the uh, their payment network for dollars, the very next day, the Chinese banking system put them on union pay and union pay is processing dollar payments for the Russian banks. We haven't sanctioned the Chinese banking system or union pay or Alipay, and we should sanction them tomorrow. Yeah, yeah the, if I, you know, if, if, well, if you or I were running a country, that would be scary uh, for a lot of people, probably not the two of us, but we would use actually the, econ- I like that comment, the tip of the economic spear, like to me, if I want to impose sanctions, primary, secondary, all the way down to, you know, this is a Canadian hockey fight and you're not getting out of this until the refs get out of the way. <laughs> like, right. it's when you're going into economic quad four. You know, you're going into both the rate of change of your growth and inflation slowing at the same time your corporate profits are, are slowing and or imploding. What's interesting now, like, guys, if you pop up slide 20, is that, you know, the, the length of this incursion, and like you said, it probably wasn't in Putin's original plan, but what it's doing is that it's just driving all of Europe into deep, what we call deep quad four, a very likely recession come the third quarter, if not the second. You know, sure. at, at, what, at what point, like, does America not understand that? Like, I mean, you can, you can easily impose 
the absolute amount of pain on them at the precise and opportune economic spear time? Yeah, so yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that uh, number one, um, you know, if all we were were economists and, and macro investors, and that's all we wanted to do uh, was make money, if that was our sole objective, right. uh, then, then we'd all be speaking Chinese tomorrow. Now, if we actually have sovereign boundaries and we want to think about our national security, our way of life, we want to think about human rights, and we want to think about the, the blood, sweat, tears, and the fights that we had to put up to get to where we are today, um, then you know what? When you're an economic quad four and you have to make some difficult decisions, they're not economic decisions. These are decisions based upon grand strategies and long-term planning to protect democracy in, in its kind of in, in its in its uh, in situ. So I, I believe that uh, you know everyone believes that economics should be governing the Fed and should be governing the presidency and that uh, we should we should just be uh, hands off and, and let these massacres happen. I believe that you, you to be a true leader, we need a Churchill, right? We need uh, a Thatcher. We need a Reagan. We need somebody out there that has the guts to make the right national security decisions and take the economic pain that we take. Again, Keith, if we impose the sanctions on Russia's energy business, which, by the way, Every day we don't impose those sanctions, the West writes $800 million checks to Putin every single day. Yeah, it's bananas. We're funding that war machine. And should we stop? Yeah, we should stop. But guess what? Guess what, Keith? You want to see an economic quad four? Take 8 million barrels off the market and you'll see where, see where Europe and the U.S. go. And well, China will go there too. Uh, but is that the right thing to do? Absolutely, it's the right thing to do. Is it going to suck? Is it going to create seven dollar pump gas yes it will uh um it's a terrible thing but it's the right thing well we're we're willing to raise interest rates allegedly nine times this year into our own slowdown so you know yeah, like, that, that, and that's not gonna that, that's I mean, not happen. That, that i know you have some thoughts on that i mean I, I know that that takes it back to what we're doing internally um but it's all part of the same thing so i mean i, I don't know how you'd not have you and i would not have at least one back and forth on the U.S. and and the Federal Reserve's current you know policy path. What do you think about that? So, I, I wouldn't agree that it's all the same thing. Here's what it is: um, the num. Now we're getting into the politics of the United States. One of the other reasons why we don't impose these sanctions is the number one knock against President Biden's administration is, of course, inflation. Right. Um, but whether 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 he should own it or not. We won't even get into. He owns it in the in the mind of of Americans uh, today, in the minds of Americans. The number two knock, of course, was the complete botched withdrawal uh, of our troops from Afghanistan. So the Democrats are facing maybe the largest red wave that's ever hit the United States in the midterms. You you wait until you see the outcome of these midterms. Um, so when you think about making the right geopolitical, long-term, grand strategic decision for our country. Uh, it's to immediately sanction the energy business. What that means politically is a much worse scenario of inflation or stagflation in the near term, right? right? Uh, uh, economic declines coupled with with uh, price hikes. Uh, so I, I think the politics of, of this situation are what's driving it. Now, let me go to the other side. You talked about the Fed raising rates. The Fed is raising rates and they're being so vocal about, uh, you know, taking shrinking the balance sheet potentially engaging in MBS sales, taking uh, almost a hundred billion off the Fed's balance sheet a month, starting here in, in, in a couple of months, at the same time as raising rates. Uh, and so the reason they're doing that is to try to aggressively kill inflation going into the midterms. And so what they can't do is drive energy prices because Putin's got that steering wheel today. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, something the Fed in their in their omnipotence believes they can control everything and they can't control energy prices. So I think the Fed is in a bad spot. I think they uh, the world. No one in the world wants to see Trump as president again. Uh, and I think they're deathly afraid uh, of of a Trump uh, resurging in 2024. We all hope that he sits down and, and lets uh, adults play in, in the elections. Uh, 
But I can tell you right now that the Fed is in a bad spot. Uh, and I think that uh, um, uh, Putin's in a horrible spot. And, uh, you know, we all know the story that Putin's telling every single one of his friends since he grew up about the rat. And uh, Putin wants to be that rat. And, and, and I think that day might be coming. Well, on that front, um, and just uh, quickly before I forget, slide 41, guys, on, on, and Kyle's you know, tweeted about this multiple times as well, on what the American consumer thinks about all of that. Uh, these are obviously the worst consumer expectations, American consumer expectations going back 11 years, which is saying something, and it's pretty sad, really. Um, and, and, and thinking about that within the lens of you know, Putin's next moves and his intentions, I have a lot of clients who come back and forth on that um, you know, displacing the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Let's start with that one. Um, and, you know, his recent moves, which have rightly, yeah, I don't know whether, I'm pretty sure he, he tried to do it, um, but again, have stabilized the ruble in the face of a lot of people thinking the ruble was going away. Um, and again, I'm not saying that that's a perpetuity, that, that, that he's going to be time stamping here, but what do you think about that? I mean, you're starting to, you know, reestablish the gold standard in rubles. That's anti-dollar. You know, this is um, this is a successful prop, uh, propaganda campaign, uh, you know, started by Russia and funded by China. Uh, China's been buying media and social media spots all over the world and pushing the Russian propaganda. Uh, uh, Keith, just think about this. We it, it, at the front end of the invasion, uh, and 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 by the way, you know, the Fed did go on tilt, and they definitely overdid it during uh, the beginning of COVID, they printed, I'm a monetarist at heart. So when you think about 40%, 40 percent more M2 in 18 months was probably too much. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I believe, you know, that's why the price levels probably moved for about 40% over the last two years and maybe more in certain areas, right? There's no Gaussian distribution of, uh, of, that, uh, of that price level move. But I think when you get to a point of uh, saying that we're going to, uh, move to a gold standard based on rubles. I think people have literally smoked too much of whatever they're smoking. I mean, when you think about the despotic uh, autocrats around the world, it, it, you say you're not gonna timestamp it. The ruble will not be a, um, a force in currency markets in the next decade or so. Even if Putin were to be removed, uh, whether it's removed by someone else or someone internally, um, uh, this world would not go back to being a, a kumbaya uh, of globalism and, and everybody rolling to see uh, uh, Klaus and Davos. Is that, that, that those days have been proven to be uh, over uh, in, in, in the in the in the medium term? Uh, so I think when you get to a scenario of people talking about the dollar losing its uh, its its uh, primacy look at just look what what has happened in the last few months <laughs> even though the fed even though the fed has gone on tilt wh yeah. where else are you going to put reserve capital europe doesn't have a central taxing authority and they still have various they don't even have a unified fighting force it's still a german army and an italian army no one has ceded their fiscal uh, authority to a greater power uh, europe's still just an idea people aren't going to put their reserves in euros and, and Europe, Europe's going to enter a, uh, they, have a, they have a worse population demographic situation. They have a worse economic situation. And you're going to go to Japan, who owns more than 120% of their own GDP on the BOJ's balance sheet? No. Are you going to go to China? Who trusts China? China? You could have a Russian situation in China in the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So there is nowhere else to put your money, Keith. Well, and, and look, Canada is a great place. But I'm worried about Trudeau and the decisions he's made in the last 12 months. Uh, and so I, 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 when you look around the world, the U.S. is still the tallest midget. And, and I think it's going to stay that way. And you look at global flows. People have been selling China. They've been selling Russia. They've been selling uh, some of the bad regimes of the world. They're buying U.S. and they're buying Canada. And that's what's happening. Well, the, uh, on the currency front in particular, you know, even the Canadian dollar has been relatively it's one of the few currencies that's been relatively strong. Uh, alongside the dollar. But when people tell me that this um, grand plan to debase the dollar or eliminate it as the world's power from a currency perspective, world reserve perspective, I just look at like, guys, show this morning's chart. I mean, we're short yens against the dollar. We're short euros against the dollar. We were short rubles against the dollar. Now you can't like these, these have been some of the greatest ideas of the year. I mean, I don't know what people are, are talking about when they're talking about the, the, the pending demise of the U.S. dollar, the dollar has been getting stronger in the last month since the incursion at a faster pace, Kyle, than than anything that matters. 
I mean, Keith, when you think about the correlation historically between, let's just say crude oil, or you could say the commodities complex in general, when you see a big move in commodities, you normally see a, a concurrent yeah. dollar dollar sell off. Yeah, that's a good point. And what you saw was a major move in commodities and a major move in the dollar stronger. I mean, uh, uh, the, the market's telling you what you and I are saying. The only the detractors or the naysayers or the people that are really propagating the oh we're gonna we're going to dollar's gonna lose global primacy and it's gonna be a bitcoin or a ruble. I mean you have to look at these people and wonder um uh, again like what what's what they've been doing for the last few days. Well I mean it's it's always a new narrative and it has to do with you know self interest. I mean just trying to get the Q and A up yeah. that has all your or, I mean like as soon as the Russian incursion happened, it's like, oh everybody's gonna buy crypto uh in Ukraine and, and use that as their new current I mean it's 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 just you know perpetual narrative, narrative, narrative to wherever people are positioned. And that's, you know, unfortunately with Twitter um, and, and, and everything else, it's just what we live in. This is a massive echo chamber. Uh, one, one thing that you just said, one of my favorite tweets, like I was just trying to find some of the best tweets that I, th I think you've had. The Davos man, and you mentioned Klaus. I mean, not everybody knows who, the, well, maybe people know who Davos man is. Uh, sh show the tweet, guys, that he had from uh, March the 15th. That's a beauty. This is, this, this, and maybe expand on it. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, Davos, obviously, with COVID, you know, went away. Maybe that was a, a blessing, the blessing of all blessings. But, you know, what, what did you mean by that? You know, I, it, this, this narrative, you remember when Xi Jinping went to Davos and gave the keynote speech and talked about how China was the responsible global actor in the world? Uh, I mean, you literally sit there and you look at yourself and you say, I must be taking crazy pills. You have the guy that is committing genocide on, on a scale that we haven't seen since World War II. You have someone that lies, cheats, and steals their way through the world uh, just to, in their sole attempt to attain global primacy. You have a, a, a regime that won't submit its companies to Western audits. You have a regime that I, you go through every single aspect of this regime and then you give Xi Jinping the stage and let him proclaim that he is the most responsible global actor in the world and that the U.S. needs to get his act together. You know, this concept of, of globalism is one that we all in our hearts, we want that to be true. We desperately want that to be true. Uh, what, these, what these despotic rulers like Putin, like Xi, like Kim Jong Un and like uh, 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 you know uh, Soleimani and and, and uh, uh, the leadership in Iran uh, really engage in is is they engage in in you know uh, propaganda campaigns and this concept of Davos man uh, being a global citizen and having their heart open and and uh, everyone playing responsibly and by the rules is a pipe dream. And these despotic rulers have just shown you how big of a pipe dream it really was. And well, so I, I don't believe that that world exists. Uh, you, Keith, you call balls and strikes. What I'm trying to do is geopolitically call that ball and strike. <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 in as many years as I've been alive, would not think that the probability was as high as it became that you would have the, again, I think a probability in terms of the rate of change of probability. So in other words, rising from somewhere, at least on my screens where I care, balls and strikes, getting markets right, um, somewhere near zero on World War III. Mm. Not, not anymore. I mean, because if you're right, Kyle, let's just say that you are. Like, I mean, I, I have no reason to believe that you're not right on that. Um, they don't want to be wrong. Mm. Well, Look, at the hinges in history, at the big events, if you were to poll people a year ago and say, if Putin were to put some troops on the Ukrainian border, would he invade and turn all of Ukraine's cities into parking lots with thermobaric bombs? What percentage of the people do you think would say yes? Very small. I mean, it'd, it'd be sub 5%, and I would, I would argue it'd be sub 2%. Yeah. Well, that's what happens at hinges in history. These are these are huge surprises. And you said something about people's incentives. I think that we are all invested in um, prosperity in one way or another. We're all very you have to be optimistic to invest. Right. I believe. Um, 
And then uh, where, where the majority of your money is, whether it's in crypto or whether it's in Canada or the US, you're going to be really uh, uh, bullish about where your money is. And I think that when you start thinking about the concentric circles of the potential negativity of that statement being true about Putin invading, or of the statement being true uh, uh, that Taiwan will surely attack, or, or China will surely attack Taiwan uh, in the coming 12 to 18 months. Uh, no one wants to think about those concentric circles of negativity because of how they impact their livelihood, their well being, their yep. savings, investments. And unfortunately, they can't do it dispassionately. They can't do it uh, unem unemotionally. Uh, they can't be pragmatic about this. They want to think that everything they've been told is true uh, in the past and that everything's going to be fine and that China isn't as bad as you say they are and that we're really just listening to the hardliners. We should be listening to, to, the, to the reformers. And I, I hear all the arguments. But in the end, Keith, what Russia just proved, you know, institutionally, People have been investing in the MSCI indices and the, the again, the globalism and the, and the Davos man uh, asset allocation model. And they've been doing so knowing. They've been <laughs> allocating money to Russia knowing a few things. They knew that Putin uh, created a false flag in Chechnya and then went in there and indiscriminately killed God knows how many people. They know that Putin invaded Crimea and took it. They knew that Putin has killed every, almost every single one of his political adversaries in a horrible way, from putting radioactive paste in people's underwear uh, to giving them milk in London with, with polonium in it. We know he kills people, and yet we still invest in Spurbank because it's the cheapest bank in the world and we need to uh, make money or we might have FOMO or we have to listen to MSCI and, and, and uh, the people that run it. And in the end, those are stupid investments. And think about how much money people have invested in China. Think about everything you know about this regime. How, how can anyone be a prudent fiduciary and make that investment? Mm. The only way is, is they, have, they just have fear of missing out and they don't want to uh, uh, not listen to the, to the index uh, senseis. And I can tell you that in the indexers have the problems of their own and they might even have a fair amount of corruption in allowing some of these countries in these indices. So I think people need to be thinking on their own two feet. They need to be thinking pragmatically and they need to be worried about how much capital they have invested in a regime of, de of a despotic killer like Putin and like Xi. Well, they just zeroed their Putin investments. And let's say they can sweep that under the rug because maybe it was less than 1% uh, of their asset allocation and they can just pretend it didn't happen. Even if it's hundreds of millions of dollars, we can yeah. pretend it didn't. I mean, there's, there, there's FOMO, uh, for one thing. There's, you had your capital there to begin with, and there's more like FOGO, not as in the uh, U.S. lacrosse guy uh, taking the face off. FOGO, like fear actually getting your money out or getting it back. I mean, that's the problem with these places, which you've documented, and, and many have, uh, all the way back to you know, Red Notice, which was a great book by Bill Browder, like on trying to get your capital, a hedge fund manager like you and I, trying to get his money out of Russia. I mean, good luck. It's, it's an yeah. ama amazing um, thing. If you don't mind, I get, in the next 10 minutes, I want to get the Q&A the &A from, the, from the crowd just to, sure. just to sure. rattle them off. I know that there are a lot of questions, and Kyle uh, has a lot of thoughts on these things. And the fir first question, one of the most highly uh, rated questions, Kyle, has to do with that um, you know, European Russian banking, Russian debt question. Um, Kyle, I hear no talk or concern regarding European banks holding Russian debt that could cause big defaults and losses. Does the risk of a bank blow up cause any concern? So uh, I, the answer is it causes concern. But when you think about the linkages uh, of the, let's say the Western banking system, so let's just connect uh, Australia, uh, the US and Canada for, 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 for better, better sake. Uh, uh, and I think about the linkages that existed during the Lehman crisis, where no one knew the extent of, of the notional exposure of the derivatives market and, and where that could lead to bank failures and that could lead to complete wipeouts of certain banks. And for the better part of uh, the financial crisis, call it 08 to 2013, we saw the U.S. banking system essentially recapitalize itself. We almost replaced all the equity in the system. We had about a trillion of equity, 17 trillion of assets uh, on balance sheet, and we pumped in about $800 billion worth of, of common and preferred over, over a multi-year period. In Europe, 
uh, they have this thing called the capital key and the, and the Bundesbank really runs the show in Europe and they couldn't figure out how to how to bail out their 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 call it their biggest problem children. They never really recapitalized the banking system of Europe. And so do I worry about European banks owning too much debt in Russia? Well, probably. Uh, is it enough to wipe out the system? Absolutely not. But think about this. Uh, what what if you had to take every Chinese investment you have uh, in equity and debt and write that down to zero? Uh, now you're talking real problems. And by the way, we are one errant activity away from that happening. Um, if we end up having the sanction, the Chinese banks, uh, if we end up, if China ends up providing military assistance or military equipment to the Russians, um, it's game time. And do, do you think again, that those those could be like, I mean, you talk about the, you know, your, your views on a sea of political red you know, votes coming out. Do you think that that could be the political promise of the midterms that gets you to the ne to, to the big one that we are a Republican candidate for president is going to promise these things and maybe a different tone than uh, Trump himself. You know, I, I don't want to attach a political party to these ideas, Keith. I mean, you look at the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy mm -hmm. Act. It's the, it's the only thing. It's the only thing the U.S. politicians push through unanimously in God knows how long. Um, I think this concept of democracy, this concept of standing with the rules based order is actually apolitical. And so mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the polling in the U.S., uh, the those that believe in the favorability of a relationship with China, with China has moved from plus 60, plus 65 to like plus 20. And those opposed to that relationship have gone in a major way negative on both sides of the aisle. So I, 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 I'm not going to say that you're going to see Democratic or Republican promises. I, I actually think it's apolitical. Well, then, I mean, in, th in that case, and there's every opportunity for those that have very low political approval ratings right now to, to see that and, and do that. I mean, if, if they're smart. Approve it. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, this next question, it's got a lot of votes and it's certainly for the record, not the way I think about it, but you know, I'm not here to ask questions that, you know, paint how I think. Um, and I can't wait to hear how Kyle Bass thinks about the answer to this question. Uh, <laughs> will there be, will there be, uh, it's not a funny question. It's a very serious question. I assume. Um, well, Will there be a time this year to finally be able to buy Chinese equities in size? Post a historic market crash in the U.S., where, wherever that comes, do you see future market performance in the U.S. paralleling Japan in the 1990s and China markets replicating the current U.S. performance? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know where I stand on this. I'm, I, am, I am shocked at how much capital is invested in a regime like the Communist Communi uh, Chinese Communist Party, I don't think uh, anyone should be invested in China. And I don't think as long as the Communist Party is standing 90 million members strong, I think you are you are engaging in a fool's errand because I don't believe you'll ever get your money back if you're invested in Chinese private equity. I think that the time for China to pretend that it was going to westernize and become a responsible member of the globe those times are gone. Uh, and so if you want to pick up a dime in front of a bulldozer and try to, quote, trade it, be my guest, my money won't be in there. And um, I think U.S. leadership, both militarily and presidentially and, and at some point in time economically, uh, is going to end up uh, uh, diverging and, and decoupling from China altogether. So I think I think you're picking up a dime in front of a bulldozer. Well, the part of the uh, appreciate the answer to that question, the Part of the question, like the U.S. replicating Japan in the 1990s, we, we are not Japan demographically. We have the only um, of consequence in terms of size, millennial generation that is, of demographics that are a massive tailwind at our back at this point, whereas the Chinese have the opposite of that for as far as the eye can see. If, if anything, you know, from here, China is going to look like Japan. It's not the other way around with the U.S. replicating yeah, Japan. So you're right. Um, if, if you study those demographic trends, I know like you have, Keith, um, we all knew what the line looked like in China going forward in, in, a, in a pretty steady decline that accelerates in, in 2035, 2040 uh, because of the, the one China policy or one child policy. Uh, uh, but what's happened recently and what she figured out, you know, remember how he clamped down on the real estate business last year? Um, they allowed rampant real estate speculation 
in China uh, to where the average home price got to be in tier one cities like 35 times average income. <laughs> well, what was happening was the Chinese men couldn't afford to buy their first house uh, when they were uh, leaving college. So they were living with their parents in their basement. Well, the men were not having sex with women because they were living in their parents' basement. So therefore they weren't procreating, they weren't marrying. So the Chinese birth rate, the average Chinese, the birth rate of the average Chinese woman today is 1.2. That has to be 2.1 just to break even on yeah. population demographics. So that line that you and I both know has basically shifted so far to the left and so far down that Xi had to take thing, matters into his own hands. So this Chinese real estate decline, this isn't a tradable, it's gonna hit a low and bounce. It is gonna hit a low and it's gonna stay there because they realized that they made a major mistake. Yeah, I mean, if you've sold, uh, we've been, we went unequivocally bearish on Chinese equities um, as you should anytime they're entering quad three stagflation um, at, you know, I guess at the beginning of last year. And I was very surprised at how many US based, particularly hedge funds were levered long China. Obviously you had the major tiger cub blow up in particular that was high profile, but um, that notwithstanding, it's just, you know, again, guys show the chart that I was showing this morning of the Shanghai Composite Index. If, if all you do is sell China, every time it bounces to a long-term lower high, you make money. You've been doing that like at least for the year and a half, in, last year and a half in particular. Um, this, this, uh, this last question here, uh, Kyle, I think is a good one. Uh, I certainly don't know the answer, but do you think, from Frank, d d does Kyle see a Taiwan invasion on the horizon and has the response on Russia changed the calculus on that? Yeah, I, I think a Taiwan invasion by China is inevitable. Really? If you go back, if you go back and look at Xi's speech to the Politburo this summer, and you look at Putin's speeches that predated Crimea in 2014 and predated this invasion, they're all telling you exactly what's going to happen. You look at the joint communique February 4th, and you see uh, what is what is coming. And, and Xi in his speech says his sole mission in life is the, quote, rejuvenation of the great Chinese race, unquote. It's important to understand the significance of what he's saying there. He is saying that if, if he fails at that recombination, the, what he referred to as the peaceful reunification of China with Taiwan, then he says he'll be a failed a fail leader. So you can bet that you're going to see China take Taiwan, I think, in the, in the coming uh, 18 months to 24 months because Putin has moved that clock so far forward. And again, think about what the world will look like in that scenario. Oh, my God. I mean, it's, um, I first think of American soldiers. I mean, is that, is, do you agree with that or no? I mean, I, I personally don't think we're going to put our men and women uh, at risk of losing their lives. We still hold uh, what I call the economic atom bomb. If we sanction the Chinese banking system, we take their ability to move dollars around um, off the table, um, their economy literally collapses in a matter of weeks. Uh, they desperately need dollars to, to basically buy everything they're short on a daily basis. There's no amount of pre-planning they can do uh, to, to withstand that kind of uh, uh, onslaught economically. I, I, if I were president, uh, I would know exactly which levers I had and, and, and whether I'm going to send aircraft carriers into the Taiwan Strait and put all 5,000 of our men and women on that aircraft carrier at risk every time I do it, uh, or I can, I can just absolutely kneecap them economically. By the way, to our detriment as well, we, that would, that would, that would yep. suffer a recession in the U.S. But again, none of these decisions are easy. There is no easy button here, Keith. Uh, so we're entering a period of time uh, in, in, into a, again, a tectonic shift or a hinge in history where we need to be thinking longer term about why we're, we're making these decisions, these asset allocations. Um, and so you mentioned the, the composite index in China. You know, uh, you think about the last pre-invasion, the 10-year average compound, or compound annual growth rate of that index was a plus 3.3 percent. Mm -hmm. The 10-year average, the 10-year average compound of the U.S. S&P was 14 and a half percent. And think about the additional risk you're taking 
of investing in an, in an, in a country like China versus a country with a real rule of law uh, and, and one that 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 tries really hard to uh, respect human rights and and individuals' rights. You know, it, it's an it's a no brainer. Uh, people have just been seduced into the tantalizing uh, 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 potential pot of gold at the end of the Chinese rainbow, and in the end, it's just going to be a big pile of crap. Well, uh, on that note, uh, you telling it like it is, like you, know, you said, I call balls and strikes. I, you, I don't think anyone will accuse you of not calling it like it is as you see it. And that's what gets the debate going. That's what America's all about. We can get, we can have these discussions. People don't have to cancel. I don't think, uh, looking at the numbers of this audience, there were, there were no cancels. It was a, a, a healthy discussion, Kyle. Thanks for, thanks for having it with me. I appreciate it. Great to be here, Keith. Thank you.